Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Saturday afternoon talk. And I've chosen to talk about the Barwell meteorite. Actually, this was uh, prompted by Sandra, who lives near Leicester, uh, and Barwell is just around the corner from there, uh, and who uh, remembers the event, I think. Um, so uh, suggested that we ought to talk about it. So I did some research and uh, Sandra and I visited Barwell and had a little look round and saw some of the evidence that's still available. So anyway, the Barwell meteorite. Sorry, someone's just joining. The Barwell meteorite. So this goes back to Christmas Eve of 1965. And uh, at the time, you may well have been hiding behind the uh, sofa because Doctor Who and the Daleks with the original Doctor Who here was uh, very much uh, in vogue at the time and terrifying everybody. But in the afternoon of Christmas Eve, this particular year in Leicestershire, a meteor described as being the size of a turkey blew up over the rise of Leicestershire and uh, created the largest observed fall of meteorites in UK history. There have been other falls, but this one was actually uh, witnessed by people live. So also on at the time, very topically, showing it was the movie Night Caller from the outer solar system an alien machine from Ganymede, moon of Jupiter, was uh, supposed to be invading the Earth at the time. So this was very indicative of the sci-fi programs of the time there. I love that uh, space creatures snatch girls to mysterious planet, night caller from outer space, etc. Uh, very typical of the sort of 1960s B movies. But at 1630, Kaboom! Mr. Crow described a bright flash and a loud bang, followed by a swish and a thud and several more thuds occurring. Jim Andrews said all of a sudden there was a tremendous bang, a roaring noise that shook the buildings and said it was awful. Out at the time, carol singing were a, a group of ladies and uh, one of them, Rosemary Leader, noticed that underfoot there was very much uh, a layer of sort of crunchy gravel on the paths. And uh, she picked a piece up, uh, but not wanting to carry it around with her, threw it away again, unfortunately, uh, not wanting to uh, clutter up her pockets. But uh, very much... Uh, the case that uh, it, obviously a lot of fragments had landed on the ground and strewn themselves all over the place. The first recorded damage was a broken window shown here in the picture and this is the Mr and Mrs Grewcock, slightly un unlikely name there but never mind, um, and they noticed that a, a fragment of something had come flying through the window, their window, much to their chagrin. And so this was also the first uh, official report because they thought somebody had been throwing stones and reported the event to the local policeman, the Bobby PC Scott. But he had also seen the flash in the sky and so actually was a little bit more clued up as to maybe what was going on. However, they didn't immediately manage to find the object that had come through the window. It took 19 days before they located it. It had managed to bounce around the room and land in a flower vase, which was an excellent place for a piece of rock to hide. And this is uh, um, uh, PC Scott holding it, being inspected to, to uh, show that it is in fact a piece of the meteorite. And I've got a clip of a piece of film with uh, the BBC here interviewing uh, Mr. Grewcock. So let's just listen to that. I hope this comes through okay. One of the people who actually saw the meteorite fall on Christmas Eve was Mr. Joseph Grewcock. Mr. Grewcock, what were you doing at the time? I went out the bank, back of our, our house, and uh, <clears throat> I heard the bang. 
And uh, then I came in and my, my wife says, uh, have you not the bill bottle? So I said, no. So she said, well, I ate some glass ago. So uh, about 10 minutes after, I went into the front room and seen the window was smashed. Well, then uh, I, I came outside and seen a piece on the, on the course. Eh? I picked this piece up and it was red off. I thought it down again. So I looked around, I seen a lot in the road and uh, I thought it dropped off for a lorry. Of course, I never think, thought no more about it. Tell the wife, the wife sister came in and uh, as it happened, she come and Bradley. told me. Bradley! You've seen the flash in the sky. Bradley! You hear the, the whizzing noise. And uh, when he come, when he got a bit further, he stood again the, again the house and held his hands again his ears. And uh, he thought he was he back in the war again. Sorry about the person shouting taxi in the background there, but uh, that's in the original film. Um, the interesting thing there with Mr. Grucock is he reported that he saw the fragment on the ground, picked it up, presumably with his bare hands, and then says it were red hot, so I dropped it again. Well, actually, we know that pieces of meteorite, when they come in from outer space, they're, of course, the meteorite is very, very cold. At minus 250 degrees C and although they appear to generate a bright flash when they're in the sky the amount of heat liberated during that time is quite small because it's a very very quick event so it heats the air that it's pushing out of the way and heats the surface of the meteorite but the core of the thing remains cold and so it's much more likely that what he was feeling was the very, very low temperature, creating a sort of burning from frostbite when he picked it up. Anyway, the first uh, actual piece to be recovered was found on the road because it had hit the driveway of uh, one of his neighbors and created a small crater in the tarmac. So here's the picture showing the crater. And it was probably one of the fragments from this impact that then went on to break Mr. Grucock's window. Second fragment to be found actually hit a car. This is one of those rare events where a motor vehicle gets struck by one of these things. It hit the bonnet of the Vauxhall Viva belonging to a Mr. Percy England. Uh, I think this is not his car, it's just a similar one. I don't think they actually have a photograph of uh, his particular Vauxhall Viva, but it punched through the uh, bonnet and destroyed the engine. It actually fractured the cylinder head. In annoyance, he then threw the object away, which was very foolish of him because it would have been uh, worth something, perhaps. Then he tried to claim on the insurance to uh, get the car repaired. But the insurance company, of course, went on to say it's an act of God. Meteorites are defined by insurance companies to be one of those act of God events that they don't take responsibility for. Um, so Mr. England went off up to the church and decided he would try and get them to pay for his <laughs> repairs. You know what happened. They sent him away. Uh, uh, clearly, they were not going to uh, pick up the tab. So that term act of God doesn't really mean what it says. Anyway, that was all the first day, the first uh, incidents. The next day, Christmas Day, a search was organised and people from Leicester Museum, the University of Leicester, the UK Geological Society and the uh, Natural History Museum all turned up to Barwell and searched and started collecting fragments. And this is one of the pieces they found on Christmas Day here. 6th of January, Dr. Ford at Leicester University found a large fragment uh, not far from uh, Mr. Crow and Mr. Greecock's houses on what is now uh, a field, but was the common and there were some allotments there. And this is them digging uh, the piece out of the ground. Um, they gradually managed to accumulate a total by the 9th of January of about 20 kilograms of uh, the, the object in, in varying sizes. And so it seems like the, the thing to do then really 
was to catalogue all the pieces and they tried to do a reassembly. So in early February, they got all the pieces together and tried to put the jigsaw back together to see how the pieces had all uh, separated from each other out of the large single object that came into the atmosphere. Didn't get very far though, only two actually managed to be uh, found that had a, a clear fit. So really suggesting that there were a large number of pieces that had not yet been found. Um, and that's a very interesting uh, part of the puzzle. And so obviously the thing to do is try and find more of it. So they actually organized a small bounty to uh, pay people to hand in more pieces if they could uh, get hold of them. And it worked, a lot more fragments were duly picked up, including one piece, 7.7 .7 kilograms, that had buried itself into the ground in the recreation pavilion, gone in 75 centimetres. That's uh, quite a deep penetration into the earth, uh, needed uh, some shovel work to get it back out again. So let's just uh, listen to these guys talk about it. When was the last recorded case of the Beth Gellert, it must have been. When was it? No. 1949. And so this is. And um, we've now had reports. Right here. Uh, How large would you say it was when it actually fell? Well, we can say that we've collected now 30, 40, 50 pounds, perhaps, but the fact have been very much larger than that. Almost certainly there are still many chunks lying about in the fields around here, still to be found. We hope that members of the public will help us by looking for these and sending the specimens they discover stations. We can get them all together at the British Museum and find out just how large and what shape this big stone was. Very interesting there that he's handling that uh, very large piece of it with no gloves, uh, no, not taking any precautions about contaminating it with the acid from his fingers and so forth. Today, nobody would even think of touching a piece of this uh, object without gloves. When was the last report? So, Patrick Moore himself decided to uh, go up and have a look. And he found a chunk and offered it to the museum. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of background noise. Thank you. So Patrick went up and offered, uh, to, well, he found a piece and said uh, that he would give it to the museum. But they said, uh, we've got plenty of it, so you can keep it uh, as long as when you pass away, you leave it back to us in your will. So here's Patrick holding the piece that he had on semi-permanent loan there in the, the photograph. But once the story was out and into the media, meteorite hunters descended on the village from all over the place um, and started uh, inflating the prices that were being offered for uh, bits of meteorite. Harold Platt, he found a larger piece, kept it on top of his piano for a while, but eventually agreed to sell it for just under 40 pounds. Uh, now, I don't know what £40 in 1965 would have been worth, but it's uh, a fairly substantial sum of money. Uh, it's enough, they say, to for him to have gone on a week's holiday, um, whether that was a, a, a week in uh, Blackpool or something, I presume, in those days. However, in 2005, a one kilogram chunk of the meteorite was valued at £20,000. So if you did have a fairly large piece lying around somewhere, um, and you live in Barwell, it might be worth getting it valued. So what was it? Well, it's obviously the case that these things are taken into the laboratory and then examined closely, uh, chemically, There's the small slices are taken, uh, put under the microscope and examined in great detail. And the uh, experts all decided that it was what's called an L-type chondrite. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you look inside the meteorite or you look at the surface of it, 
you see lots and lots of these little tiny round grains of silicate em embedded within it, all these little orangey colored bits and the gray bits, these little round droplets. Those are called crondules. Uh, they're little, little spherules of, uh, of material from the original solar nebula out of which all of the, the planets and the sun and everything in the solar system was made. So originally the uh, cloud of material around the young sun would have been formed of just lots and lots of these little tiny droplets that had condensed as they cooled from a vapor uh, down into a liquid and then solidified as these little round uh, droplets out in space. Before then, gravity gradually did its work and brought them together to form larger accretions. Um, and that's an ever increasing process. The, larger the lump, the more gravity it has, the more it tends to accumulate larger pieces. So we have quite a lot of chondrites on Earth of different types. It refers to the fact they contain these inclusions. Here's another photograph of a piece of the Barwell meteorite. You can see the black fusion crust. So this was on the outside of the meteorite when it was coming through the atmosphere. This was the layer that got superheated, but the rest of this has been untouched and would have been very much uh, at sort of super chilled temperatures when it reached the ground. Now, some of these uh, chondrites are actually older than the Earth. We've got uh, some pieces that date back to about 6 billion years ago, the Earth dating back only 4.5 billion years ago. But the L-type chondrites are a particular group. Um, and the, interestingly, 38% of all the meteorites that land on Earth are of this type. So it's a very, very common fragment. Um, it was interesting that perhaps you would think, oh, well, Barwell might be a very unusual meteorite, but it's not. It's perhaps an example of the most common type of meteorite of all. It's got evidence of shock in it, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, it means that it was broken away from a parent body in some sort of ancient impact event. So although the, the material itself is mostly made of this unmodified uh, gr grains from the early solar nebula, it had got together to form a, a larger asteroid um, of some sort, a large space rock, and then been broken off it again. Um, in an enormous explosion. This shows really what a violent place the early solar system was. Here's a scan through a thin section of it under the microscope, and you can see the amazing detailed structure inside it. Um, let's go in a bit closer. You can see how the crystals, many of them, are fragmented and cracked. Uh, you can see all these fractures through the, the individual grains. This is what I mean by it's been shocked. There was a huge uh, event that blasted this piece off of the main asteroid and all of the quartz crystals and so on that are making it up have got the evidence of that huge shock wave passing through. We see that in uh, rocks that have been exposed to uh, nuclear explosions or other impacts on the earth. Here's, a, here's another view of it where we've used a cross polar um, microscope to give a, a sort of color contrast to the different grains. And you can see some of this is uh, silvery gray metallic iron mixed in with the rock grains and the iron sulfide coming through there in, in yellow in the uh, mineral called trollite. So where do these uh, chondrites come from? Well, there are three subclasses of them that we can trace back actually to each to a different parent asteroid body. And it's amazing that we can do this. In each case, that parent <coughs> body was blasted in an impact and the fragments thrown out across space. The first class is the H class of Crondite not the Barwell meteorite. And these come from asteroid number six, EB. 
And the H actually rather unimaginatively stands for high in metals, H for high. So it should be no surprise that the L class uh, meteorites come from somewhere else and mean low in metal. And the place that they come from is the flora family of asteroids. So number eight, flora, quite a big one, slightly smaller, 43 Ariadne and 433 Eros are examples of the flora family of asteroids that all exhibit the same material as these L-class um, meteorites. And then finally, there's the LL-class. Guess what that means? It means very low in metal. And the Chelyabinsk meteorite that blew up over Russia in 2013, that was a, an example of an LL meteorite. But the Barwell meteorite is L-class from the flora family. <clears throat> we can figure that, all that out because if we look at the oxygen content of these uh, meteorites, we can plot how much of the heavy isotope of oxygen, oxygen 18, along the uh, bottom axis here and the y-axis contains the percentage of oxygen isotope 17. And you can see the L-class ones are in purple and cluster right in the middle here, the H ones further down and the LLs up to the top here. And the Barwell one is indicated by the cross with the big arrow pointing at it. So it's slap bang right in the L-class. And that tells us it's part of this flora family. Now, I said that the chrondules and they uh, date right back to the formation of the solar system. But when we date other crystals within the Barwell meteorite, we get a different age. What we actually do is look at uh, uranium and see how rapidly the radioactive atoms of uranium decay into uh, unradioactive um, lead. And the original uranium is captured into a crystal when it solidifies. That's a very selective process. So you get all uranium and no lead. But gradually over time, the uh, uranium atoms turn into lead atoms. And so if you look at the same crystal years later, you can see the ratio of uranium to lead. And knowing the radioactive half-life of uh, uranium, you can work out how long it has been since that crystal formed out of a uh, molten droplet of liquid. Um, and the date we get back is as it shows on the screen there, 467 million years ago. That's much, much younger than the age we were talking about, going back to the beginning of the solar system, 4.5 billion years ago, 10 times further back in time than this date of 467. And when we also look at the meteorite, we, we can see that it has undergone some transformation as a result of pressure and temperature. So the chrondules might be from the original uh, material dating way back to the origins of the solar system, but clearly the whole ensemble was part of a larger asteroid that was big enough to start the process of forming a core in the center. The radioactivity and heat trapped from the result of the impacts of uh, one body on another melts the core. And then you find that the uh, heavier, denser metals sink to the core and the lighter rock floats to the surface. Um, and so you get a differentiated planet like Earth. And of course, the, the bigger the planet, the uh, more inclined it is to do this. But what we figure out from the amount of melting that's gone on is that the parent body of the flora family and all the L chondrites would have been a small baby planet around 200 kilometers across. So large enough to generate a little bit of this differentiation process a little bit of mild uh, metamorphosis, but not enough to go the whole way and form a, a fully cored planet like the Earth. And then 467 million years ago, something very violent happened to that baby planet. 
it was impacted by another object at very high speed and shattered into all of the fragments that we detect either on Earth or out there in space today. Um, it was orbiting around in the asteroid belt, minding its own business, and suddenly another space rock hit it, and that, that created the enormous shock waves that we see that are responsible for the crystal structure and blew thousands, millions, in fact, of fragments all over the solar system. It created asteroid flora, the largest chunk of the survivor, 57% of the total mass, we think, Ariadne just 9%, and the rest of the flora family has 13,000 members that we know about out there, all hurtling around the solar system. Um, and it makes up about uh, one in 20 of the total asteroids in the uh, whole of the asteroid belt now are part of this flora family. Flora itself orbits out there um, between Mars and Jupiter. It's quite big, it's 146 kilometers in diameter, making it the 10th largest asteroid that we know. Um, and it has that correct surface mixture of silicates and nickel iron, exactly like we find for the uh, L chondrites. It's very nearly round, very nearly spherical, so not quite large enough for gravity to have uh, forced it into a fully round object, but it's getting there. Um, and it's 80% of the total mass of the remaining flora family. So this is really the, the large piece that uh, survived and all the other fragments were blown everywhere. Uh, we know a lot about one of them, number 951 Gaspara, because the Galileo probe visited it uh, on the way out to uh, Jupiter on its mission there. And interestingly, that object, Gaspara, uh, dated slightly younger. Um, so it may have had another collision since uh, the main fragmenting of the parent of the flora family. Now, you know, I looked up uh, about flora and it appears in some uh, more of that B-movie science fiction, The Green Slime Are Coming, is a 1968 film talking about the green slime uh, following flora coming into collision with the earth. So it seems that uh, there's certainly uh, no escape from these sorts of uh, movies featuring in this story. Just a little word then about the, the asteroid families that we know about. We can identify them in several ways. And this is a, a nice plot here. This is the distance from the sun from uh, measured in units of multiples of the Earth's uh, Earth sun distance, that would be one. So Mars is at about two here and Jupiter would be off to the right at five. So this is most of the main asteroid belt. And you can see colored in blue here, these are all the flora uh, family and all the others are colored in, as you can see, with their names on them to the Vesta family and so on. And it, so we plotted the distance from the sun along the bottom and the orbital eccentricity, so how elliptical the orbit is. And this separates them into these different orbital groups. And what you'll have to imagine here is that these fragments, they were all part of one object that was traveling around the sun with a certain orbit and a certain amount of momentum. And then a big impact on it happened and blasted all these fragments. But they share mostly that same momentum and that same path around the sun as the original parent. And so they're all traveling together in a very much like a shotgun blast. It's been fired out of the end of a shotgun, all traveling together around the sun in a group. Um, that's not to say that there weren't other fragments that went in other directions. These are just the ones that are still there, more or less in the same orbit. Other fragments would have gone uh, in, in wild and random directions around the solar system. And the other way we can identify them is to look at them with uh, spectroscopy and see what they're made of and classify them 
And you can see that the different spectral types, C, M, S, V, E, et cetera, here, just uh, names for the different groups, um, C for series in this particular thing here, but it's also C for carbon, because there's quite a lot of carbon in these. S for sulfur, uh, 433 Eros, that was one of the L-class uh, flora family that we uh, looked at just now. So the flora family itself um, was responsible for something rather important as well. Normally, about 100 tonnes a day of material falls into the Earth's atmosphere. That adds up to about 40,000 tonnes a year. So it's quite an accumulation. But suddenly, one day, 467 and a half million years ago, the number of infalling meteorites went up by a factor of 3,000 times. Suddenly, the Earth was absolutely bombarded by meteorites. Here's a plot that shows the number of meteorite strikes that we know about over time. Now, the fact that there are none right back here might be that we haven't detected them, but the interesting part is this graph in more recent times where the data is a bit more certain. And you can see the number was going along and suddenly shot up here um, and then went down again. The reason it goes up, of course, towards the end is it's easier to know about the younger ones. So the, the exponential rise there that's showing, that's the observational selection problem of uh, it's easier to know about uh, more recent ones than older ones because the evidence disappears. But clearly here, there was a massive spike compared to the background rate. And we have evidence for that. There's a, a cliff here in uh, India, and you can see going along the cliff, I'll, I'll point it out with the mouse pointer, along this line here, there is a black line running along the cliff. This dark gray material is absolutely packed with asteroid dust fragments and bits of meteor. And the bits of meteor that it comprises are the L-type grondites. So the exact same material as the Barwell meteor. And there were millions and millions of these impacts all over the Earth for a very short period of time. This date, of course, matches the date that we got from the uranium lead content of the Barwell fragment and is, the, is telling us the date at which the flora parent body underwent that impact and was blasted into a trillion pieces. And an awful lot of those came like a shotgun blast across the solar system and landed over the Earth. Back at the time, this period is in the middle of the Ordovician era. 488 to 444 million years ago. So 467 is in the middle of that. And the sea was full of these uh, lovely creatures, the nautiloids um, and the sea spiders and so on, uh, uh, making their way around. They'd evolved uh, from the uh, very early in Precambrian times, about 100 million years before, and uh, been diversifying into all these wonderful creatures. Um, but 467 million years ago or so, they uh, had this very bad day when all these meteors came in. Here is a meteor, meteorite fragment, and this is a piece of fossilised nautiloid up in the top of the photograph here. And here's another fragment here trapped in the same uh, rock. So these dates to this, this time when a very large increase in the amount of uh, infalling material occurred and to a massive mass extinction. The temperatures across the earth nosedived, the ice advanced once more from the uh, poles towards the equator, accelerating the cooling as it reflected more um, sunlight back into space. Sea level plummeted as water was locked up in ice in the form of glaciers on land and started freezing out of the uh, atmosphere, reducing its greenhouse effect, making it even colder. So it was a sort of triple whammy, this one. 
triggered by all of that dust in the atmosphere from all of these infalling objects, uh, a, a sort of nuclear winter effect, blotting out the sun for thousands and thousands of years and creating one of the largest mass extinction events that we know about. In addition to the, uh, it, uh, the asteroid fragments in the rock, we've also got quite a few large craters that date to that period. This is Canada, the Clearwater Lakes, the East Lake, 26 kilometers across, uh, is um, dated to that time, four, six, five million years ago, part of the flora bombardment, as we call it. Uh, the other crater is much younger, 286 million years, and came at a different time. We also found craters on the historic continent of Baltica, so down here, what was Scandinavia, or would, would become Scandinavia, Norway and Sweden here. One, two, three, four, five um, different craters, all dating to this same period here. So craters form fairly regularly, but suddenly there was a, a flock of uh, craters all caused by this L-chondrite parent body, the flora family um, event coming down. And all of those craters would have got have thrown more dust and dirt up into the atmosphere and been part of the reason for this uh, enormous mass extinction. 60% of all that marine life died, but life's very resilient and it came back again in, and diversified again during the second half of the Ordovician era until 444 million years ago when the Ordovician gives way to the next period in time, which is the Silurian. And that too uh, marked a second mass extinction event um, in fairly short order. And this time we think it was caused by the explosion of a very large star. A hypergiant star blew up about 6,000 light years away. So you'd think that would be far enough away to be safe. But it uh, was such a large star, it gave off a gamma ray burst and the gamma rays irradiated the atmosphere and tended to uh, damage the creatures that were living near the surface of the sea, but not really penetrating any deeper than that. And that was the event that uh, wiped out uh, quite a proportion of the living creatures, giving rise to the end of that Ordovician era and the recreation, the rebound of life again in the Silurian. So this is an example of how some of these astronomical events turn out to be very, very important in understanding the evolution of life on Earth. And of course, one of the most famous was the uh, Chicxulub event where 66 million years ago, a huge object smashed into Mexico on the Yucatan Peninsula and uh, brought the dinosaurs to a rather sticky end, hence uh, the book here, T-Rex and the Crater of Doom by Walter Alvarez, who was one of the scientists who uh, discovered this. And here's the radar map of the uh, resulting huge crater. But it's not the only crater from around 66 million years ago. We've also got uh, three others, the Baltish Crater in Ukraine, the Silver Pit Crater in the North Sea and the Shiva uh, crater in the Indian Ocean um, are all dated to around about that same time period. And of course, I'm mentioning it because the Chicxulub impactor was probably another stray member of the flora family. So the flora family event has got more than one um, uh, case of blood on its hands for creating mass extinctions on the earth. So chunks of that flora event are still landing today, or at least in living memory. Here's the plaque uh, in Barwell that says on Christmas Eve in 1965, one of the largest meteor falls recorded British history landed close to this site. It says its flaming arrival was followed by a sonic boom before the 4.5 billion year old rock exploded into hundreds of pieces. Now that 4.5 billion year old figure 
is lifted from the uh, fact that it's uh, got those chrondite uh, chondules in it. Those are certainly four and a half billion years old, but the rock itself is arguably 467 and a half million years old from that flora event. This chunk here, this is in the National Space Center and uh, was uh, one that was found on the allotments just uh, away from Mr. Crow's house and had buried itself in the ground. Now they're still celebrating the event in uh, Barwell. The 59th uh, anniversary reunion occurred a few years ago and here's the Reverend Andy Taylor from the local church. Um, the uh, fragments of the meteorite were brought back to the church and people were able to come along and see them and uh, discuss the event. One of the chunks that you can actually go and see is in the Leicester Museum and there's yours truly pointing at it in its very proudly in its glass case, 2.2 kilograms of it. And this was the chunk dug up on his allotment by uh, Harold Platts. There's a couple more photographs of it for you from different angles showing the different faces with the, the blackened uh, fusion crust from the outside of the object um, and then the fractures where the other pieces have been blasted away from it. And they got a couple of nice uh, posters up for the display here talking about it, telling you some of the facts that I've already uh, gone through in this talk. Uh, here's Mr. Grucock again pointing at his window and the hole in the driveway. There's the hole on the driveway with the gate open and PC uh, Scott holding the chunk and a little map of Barwell showing actually individual dots. They really could do with this in colour, but these little round dots mark not houses but where the fragments were found so if you look at this really closely you can see where they were scattered and this is a good example of what's called a strewn field where the uh, meteor blows up um, in the atmosphere due to the intense pressure of coming in so fast gradually into thicker and thicker air and eventually the uh, stress fractures it into uh, a million pieces um, and you get a, a sort of shotgun blast of it landing on the earth. And as yours truly stood by the uh, green plaque um, that they have on another piece of rock that is not part of the meteorite. The meteorite wasn't that big and heavy. I guess it's that big so that nobody pinches it by mistake, but it's just mounted in a piece of local stone there. Um, you can uh, sort of... Uh, Go on to various uh, meteorite sites and you might want to try and buy a piece, 65 quid a gram at the moment. Um, here's a few pieces that were sold in 2020 at the uh, auction in Bonhams um, and they were describing it very accurately and saying, well, you want to spend nearly $10,000 on, on this piece, which is a fairly sizable chunk. So it's uh, very, very valuable and still very sought after today, actually. And here's another lovely photograph of it against a copy of the Leicester Mercury. So I'll bring the talk to an end there. There's more to say about other meteorites that have fallen in the UK. And it seems that on average in the last hundred years or so, we've had about one of these falls every 10 years. And the most recent one, of course, was in Gloucestershire in 2021, the Winchcombe meteorite. But that's for another day. So thank you very much for listening and I'll bring it to a close there.